Hello, everybody, for the ninth week in a row. We didn't miss a week, right? No, I don't think we did. And for the second last time, we are here to talk about House of the Dragon. This one is season one, episode nine. Quite a famous, uh, quite a famous episode number to be in Game of Thrones. But here we are. Didn't really have an episode nine moment, really, at all. Um, they sort of almost teased it by having. Uh, similar things at the end as Rhaenys is being hurried to a big event in the middle of the city, um, like Arya is at the end, um, but nobody was decapitated. Anyway, we'll get into all of that later. We're here again, solo, Elite Ari, uh, is not here, still sick, still recovering. Uh, I probably wouldn't expect him to be back next week either. Um, maybe I'll try and, uh, rope Mr. R or somebody into doing the big finale thing. Eventually, whenever Ari is better, we will get him back and we'll do, we'll talk about the two episodes, I'm sure. Um, nonetheless, we're riding solo again. I'll rely on chat if anybody comes, but, uh, building House of the Dragon up is me ignoring chat. Uh, does not have people scurrying to come and join. Uh, nonetheless, I got notes. Heath is indeed here. I'm still at episode six. Give me a face. Uh oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, catch up. What's that? Three hours worth, or probably a little bit more, of shit to watch. That's that's how it should be. That's that's a fun time. <laughs> Nonetheless, I guess we just got to get into it. Where do we go? Where do we go initially? Um, initially, uh. I can't remember what episode previously, but initially after finishing watching, I had a very similar feeling I think I had to maybe episode six, or maybe it was episode five. I feel like it might have been episode six, where it was, uh, I enjoyed it the whole time, and then towards the end it kind of lost me, and then I was left with a weird feeling afterwards. Now, I do think this episode is probably better than both episode six and probably, and, and episode seven. Um, I don't think it's as good as the first five or last week, which I thought recaptured the magic of the first five. Though, um, the more I've thought about it and the more I've gone back to rewatch, the more I have liked this episode. So overall, those are my, uh, my tentative thoughts. Uh, we'll explore them, obviously, in the hour and a half or so to come. Um, the tricky thing is where to start at this episode. This episode, um... I don't know if they had announced this or if it had just been part of the leaks. So uh, the, the, uh, This whole season leaked at some point, I think pretty early on, um, and they've been pretty majorly accurate. Uh, I have not looked at the leaks because uh, I don't want to be spoiled to what's happening in each episode. Um, uh, just the events and where we're going to end and things like that. I think that's fun to find out as I keep going. Um, but like the week before episodes, the big Twitter accounts will just post some leak stuff. Um, like, they had posted that, like, oh, Rhaenyra's not going to be in this episode, which I don't think was said anywhere. Maybe in, like, a, one of the big articles or something. Maybe a, a director or a showrunner might have mentioned it. So maybe I'm making things up. But, um, a similar thing was done for next week's episode where it was said that, um... Uh, Alicent's not going to be in next week's episode, which kind of, uh, potentially indicates that uh, a certain thing cannot happen next episode because Allison has to be in it. Now, if you watch the preview, the other thing is happening next episode, so... Um, I don't know if it's an episode 9 moment next episode, but uh, something akin to that. <laughs> Which they could have shoehorned into 9 if they had sped things up, but uh, I feel like I like the way. Uh, if anything, we all want them to go slower than they have. Um... Nonetheless, so this was a whole episode in King's Landing basically about the Greens. We don't see Damon or Rhaenyra um, or anybody else this episode. And it is interesting because Viserys and Corlys have obviously also been pretty major characters throughout the entire season. And neither of them are in it. Viserys is dead and Corlys is still up in the air. Um, again, we don't spoil things for the um, for the anime onlys here. Um, so we won't go into too much about uh, whether or not Corlys is going to survive or not. Rainey's is in it quite a bit. Uh, she seems to be Team Black by the end. I don't think that's a spoiler. Um, so she's the only Black around. Um, they are. Have they formally called them the Blacks yet? I don't think... Maybe they have? They have definitely said Greens. But whatever, they're our sides. Um, this episode obviously was called the Green Council. Uh, the Green Council is one of the big famous scenes. Um, 
from the Dance of Dragons, and it was over in like five minutes. We opened the episode, I guess we're diving in uh, specifically here. <laughs> we opened the episode on sort of morbid uh, shots of the castle and things like that. I thought we were getting wooed into a uh, season uh, six, episode 10 atmosphere where the music would sort of guide the first 20 minutes or so of the episode. Um, still great. Still love that, uh, at least the beginning portion of that episode. Uh, we didn't go that far with it. It's just the first few minutes where the music sort of directs things. There's a little kid we're following who turns out to definitely not be a little bird. It's something different. Uh, goes to, is it Talia or something? Which is uh, Alison's head handmaid. Her title is an, uh, it might be headmistress, though probably not. It sounds like the manager of a whorehouse. I know, there's a, there's a certain uh, designation for her. She's basically... Uh, we saw her last episode, and we know that she uh, works for Missaria, which comes back into play later in the episode with uh, the Lara scene. Um, nonetheless, uh, she's there, and she is told about it first, and then she reports it to the Queen, and probably to Missaria, because um, later Missaria does know that the King is dead when the general public doesn't know, and Otto is sort of caught off guard by this. Um, but yeah, and then... Allison is told. She cries a little bit. Now, this is something that's reiterated upon a few times in the episode, is Allison crying over Viserys, which is interesting, because again, with the evil stepmother stuff we were doing in uh, episode six and seven, it seemed like maybe we were going to say that younger Allison had some sympathies for Viserys. She isn't really in love with him in the way uh, a husband and wife probably should be. She's probably not very attracted to him. This is shown um, as we intercut between the sex scenes in episode four. Uh, Sarah's not exactly exciting to a 19, 20-year-old girl. Um, nonetheless, I thought they might have been going in the, like, younger Alison maybe cared about him, though obviously there are shortcomings there, and older Alison had grown, uh, what's the word? Grown dissatisfied, grown awares, grown, uh, regretful, something there. Uh, the, the, the fucking word is imperative to get to the next point. Um, resentful, maybe, is the word I was looking for. Um, and, and that she might hate Viserys from there on, but no, clearly there is, it is a more complicated feeling than that. And the show has consistently, even in the episodes I haven't liked as much, um, or in a general sense, I guess, has, uh, uh, made feelings and feelings about people more complex. Like, even the Otto stuff, and I remember pointing this out in, I, I think that is episode four as well, um, about how, like, Otto is positioned kind of um, as a little finger Varys esque character. But um, those characters would never have loved Robert or Joffrey or, or Tommen or anything like that. Um, they're just sort of schemers for scheming's sake. But um, the House of the Dragon has taken more of the approach of, like, being around people will sort of ingratiate you to them. Uh, and so Otto does actually care about and potentially, like, love Viserys, which is interesting. And that is continued through this episode when he finds out he does, he does look a little sullen and he's staring at a fire. Uh, and then he does immediately, quicker than Alicent, go into scheming mode. Um, but it, it, is, it is... They've done a good job at keeping, like, these relationships complicated. Um, uh, and I like that. Uh, and Alison crying here was cool. I like that too. Now, again, Alison, we fell back in love with her last episode. I would say that's continued on, I still think. Uh, Alison is very clearly, like, the protagonist of this episode, I would say. Um, sort of against Otto initially, then against Aegon. Um, and continuing throughout. Uh, though I guess Rainies could be two, I guess. Um, nonetheless. Uh, they continued the Alicent not just being evil stepmother stuff. Um, and I like that. Um, so we were going chronologically there initially. I can't remember specifically. Oh, the Green Council scene. That's what we're building up to. Uh, I expected it to be like 20 minutes. Um, it's like th three minutes. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, I guess... Hold on, let me look over the notes. I guess I just have this note. The Lord Beesbury death is obviously, I think, uh, it might have been last time, and I may have hinted at it a few times in a few other reviews. I kept telling Ari to remember who Lord Beesbury is because he might be important. Uh, the important thing is, he is supposedly the first um, casualty of the Dance of Dragons. Um, Robo Ghost has shown up in chat. Long time no see with that one. Are you going to be spoiling book shit? Shit? 
Are you going to be spoiling book shit like all the other cuck lords? I indeed have sw uh, sweared a solemn oath. Uh, that in these videos there is no book shit spoiled, but don't watch the Minty video on the second channel, because that has all the spoilers in it. Because usually Ari is here, and he's a uh, anime only, like it seems Robo Ghost is, so we like to, uh, we avoid the spoilers, um, around here. Anyway, Lord Beesbury we were talking about. Um, I kept hinting at Ari, remember Lord Beesbury, because he's the first casualty in the Dance of Dragons, and a lot is made of his death here uh, at the Green Council. He's sort of the only one that stands defiant, um, surrounded by lords that are all either already conspiring, which is interesting, and Allison is sort of offended at that initially, um, which again, adds to her characterization. Um, but, um, yeah, his... Uh, he's, they made him sort of old and... Um, senile a little bit in the butt of jokes previously. Um, when I remember this scene, I think back to the lore stuff that's on um, one of the DVD stuff, which is initially how I was introduced to the Dance of Dragons. It would be interesting to go back and watch that, actually. Um, I was going to say I rewatched a certain part of it, but that would have been a spoiler, and we just promised RoboGhost no spoilers. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It seems it seems cooler in sort of the mythos that Lord Beesbury is the one that stands up here, and in the in in that uh, in the history and law stuff, the story they go with is that Kristen Cole cuts his throat. Um, his death was a bit weird. It definitely was. Uh, instead, he just like smashes his head down. And a big thing before the season started was everybody was like, "What's with the balls and the small council and the little things?" I guess this was the point: is that they wanted to have him smash Beesbury's head, but it wasn't even intentional. Like, it's way cooler for Beesbury and Kristen Cole in that example. Now, in Fire and Blood, there are other um, potentialities of what happens in the Green Council, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, yeah, so in the little history and lore thing, like, Kristen is seen as this, like, merciless, like, cool, I'm um, the fucking cutthroat for the Queen and, and Otto, let me cut his throat if he's going to dissent we will have none no dissent um but instead here he kind of it's kind of another like lamau Kristen cole loses control and smashes his head um and uh, in season in episode five there was a big hubbub made about like oh how's Kristen cole still allowed to be around why isn't he arrested or whatever and i came up with 50 different reasons to es explain that away and i was like oh his anger's kind of justified it seems, like, repeatedly that after episode five, Kristen Cole has just gotten, like, a temper, um, and he sort of loses control all the time. And it's kind of lame for his characterization. He was in the episode a lot more, but it's still... He's still as one note as Allison sort of was in those... Uh, in episode six and seven. Um, I don't know. And I don't know when the opportunities will come in the future for Kristen to get more interesting. Outside of a reunion with Rhaenyra... Um, I was going to say whether the likelihood of that, but that would be a bit of a, a spoiler. I thought you'd pick up the ball if you want to talk instead of raising hands. I guess that would be cute, but it's just sort of like a roll call thing. Like I'm here, Lamau, um, which is uh, whatever. Uh, it's kind of cool looking, I guess. Um, but so far, the only effect it has had on the plot is um, this part, if it even had an effect. Um, they do say he's old right before it, so it kind of makes sense that they might crush his skull or something. I don't know. Older skulls are more fragile. That's my uh, layman understanding of uh, biology and medicine, I guess. Um, but yeah, it just makes Kristen less cool because he's not a cutthroat. Um, and it makes Beesbury less cool because he sort of dies pathetically and just almost accidentally. And then, like, the, the Lannister dude's reaction to this and him just sitting... I don't know. It was, it was a little... It was a little odd, and it just... It didn't feel... It just felt weird. Um, and I think that's sort of the point, is that they kind of act like it didn't happen, and it's kind of uncanny in that sense, how it just continues. But also, in the preview last time, it showed uh, Harold Westling pulling out his blade, who is Lord Commander of the King's Guard. Well, no more, I guess, after this episode. Um, we'll talk about him in a second, because his characterization is a little weird. Uh, especially what he says in the scene. When you'd think he'd be totally down with Rhaenyra, but he says, until there's a king, I'm not required. It's like, 
I guess he doesn't want to say that because he thinks maybe he will get killed, but he's also doing a defiant thing anyway. So I don't think he's, like, fearful of his own safety. But then I thought, oh, they're going to have Kristen kill fucking Beesbury, cut his throat, and then he's going to kill Harold Westerling, and it's going to be like, oh, Kristen Cole, what a what a prick, but what a badass. Um, but th- then he just walks away too. Um, I don't think this is bad. I was talking to Minty about this, and he's like, oh, it's so dumb that they just let him leave. Um... I feel like they have to let him leave, because if he beats Cole, which is not impossible, they're both Kingsguard, they're supposed to be very good fighters, then he would just kill everybody that's in there, presumably, uh, and I don't think any of them could stand up to him, um, so it's kind of whatever that they let him go. Now, Harold Wrestling dies way before the dance in the books, so I don't know if we're going to get his death next episode somehow, um, or maybe he just walks away and we never see him again, which is okay, but also in his characterization, which they never really hinted at past, like, the first two episodes, and basically only in the first one, is his relationship and his closeness to Rhaenyra, you'd think they would reiterate upon that, again, there's just an opportunity for Cole to cr- kill him in the scene, and it would have been like, well, fuck this Kristen Cole brick, uh, and he dies for Rhaenyra, and it could have been a cool emotional moment, but even here, he doesn't say anything about Rhaenyra, or pledging himself to her. It's a little weird. Um, yeah, Cole has been stale after his attempted suicide. Um, I don't even know... I don't know if stale is the right word. It's just, like, one note, I guess. That's a, a synonym for stale. Um, but indeed. So, this was sort of underwhelming as the Green Council scene. The the titular... Game of Thrones titles are always weird because you speculate about the specific titles and then you 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 think, like, I assumed, like, maybe the... Like, before we knew Viserys was dying in episode 8, I thought maybe he would die towards the beginning of episode 9 and then, like, the Green Council scene would be the end scene. But it seems consistent with Game of Thrones stuff that, like, the title scene is usually in, like, the first 20 minutes. Because um, the next one is called The Black Queen. So we're going to get Rhaenyra being crowned on Dragonstone at the beginning, I assume. Um... But nonetheless, um, it just wasn't very long. Uh, All While is interesting, who is the Black Maester, um, because he initially, he says something interesting, but I can't remember the specific line. He says, like, hold your tongue to, uh, to Beesbury, but he also doesn't seem as committed as everybody else. Like, Jasper Wilde is over there, and he's already, he's one of the ones that have already been making plans, and they want to get rid of the City Wash dudes that are still loyal to Damon and things like that. Um, Otto's clearly been scheming behind the scenes too, and probably the Lannister dude. I actually found out, and I guess it makes sense, that the Lannister dude, it's one dude playing both the twins, um, which is funny and cute, Lamau. Um, there was a tweet about that or something. Um, but yeah, the, the, the council stuff happens at the beginning. Uh, another interesting through line is... Um, Alicent believing what she heard, um, or believing what she understood to have heard, he- heard, Viserys' Aegon meme at the end of the last episode, she believes what she is doing is Viserys' wish, um, which gives her sort of a moral authority, I guess, internally, that what she's doing is right and doesn't make her think that she's scheming. Now, again, the whole prophecy stuff doesn't exist in Fire and Blood or in the books or in any uh, understanding of the Dance of Dragons I've seen previously, but neither has Rhaenyra and Alicent being sisters. Uh, but that's a massive, massive, maybe the most important and most interesting part of this entire show. So I'm not criticizing it for being different. Um, but it changes her role in all of this as well, because um, she doesn't seem as much of a schemer. All the scheming is sort of left off on Otto. Um, so it is interesting where it's incredibly convenient, obviously, to anybody that's hearing this. Like, nobody really buys that Alicent, like, Rainey doesn't buy it, all the lords in the hall later don't buy it. Uh, even the people at the small council are like, yeah, this is just something Otto's saying to justify it, but obviously it's a lie. But the fact that it isn't a lie gives uh, Alicent some sympathy in these scenes. Because um, when people sort of, like, roll their eyes at her, she says that, you feel bad for her. Even if you kind of... Obviously, the dramatic irony here is that the audience knows that she misinterpreted that. Um, but you can't really blame Alison for misinterpreting things, I guess. Um, so there's sort of a, a righteousness to Alison's actions throughout. Um, but yeah, um, Green Council seemed crazy, huh? Uh, I touched on all the things in my notes here. Um, we sort of cut around to everybody finding out that Viserys is dead. Um, 
Nobody seems to care but Alicent and Otto s- slightly. The kids don't seem to care that much. It seems like they're distant from their father. Aegon obviously is, and that's a big thing that we'll get into later. Um, there is an interesting scene. I guess this is where we talk about uh, Helena. Um, reeling off of last episode, I, the more I thought about it, the more I really liked her as a character, and I thought it was really cool what they did with her last episode. But she's kind of reverted again... Not again, as in again another character reverting, but not again as in Helena's reversion again. Um, to just being cryptic and not really having any sort of personality characterization. Like, I thought her and Jace dancing last episode was the cutest thing I ever saw. Her speech beforehand about, like, yeah, he'll just ignore you or something, but her saying it in the way she did ingratiated her a lot to me. I thought she was really likable, and I was like, yeah, and knowing where things are going, it makes things a lot more interesting. Now, also what makes her interesting is the weird prophecy meme stuff they've incorporated into her character, but I want the focus to be less immediately on that. Now, obviously, the beast beneath the floorboards probably was in reference to Melis and Rainy's popping out at the coronation. Um, I speculated that it had something to do with the rats. Um, I guess it makes sense that she can't foresee the rats, because then that would bring up things later. Um... But uh, we really can't delve too much into that unless we get into spoilers. Um, uh, yeah, I don't want her to become like Bran. It is she is teetering on the line a little bit, where Bran is just completely boring when he came back because he was a computer meme, um, and she isn't really like that. Like even when she does it, like um, they're definitely playing into the autistic angle a lot, and I think intentionally. Um, so it's almost like a tick, I guess, for her. Now, the interesting thing is initially when I watched this scene, I was like, uh, initially she's starting with a monologue where she's sort of going on like a philosophy monologue about, um, I think I actually wrote it down. No, I just said greed. One takes what a, what, uh, what another has. And obviously this uh, is a metaphor for the throne thing that's happening in this episode. Um, but she's saying it to like a handmaiden who's playing with the kids while she's sewing. And handmaid's like, yes, yes, princess. That's so smart. And not really... Uh, she isn't picking up on the social cues that uh, this is not a conversation that is, like, appropriate for right now or whatever. <laughs> so initially, that was, like, whatever. Um, but then what Alison comes in to basically tell her, and then Eamon arrives to tell them that, the, that her father is dead, that their father is dead. Um, and as she's trying to start, Helena just sort of cuts her off there as beast beneath the floorboards or whatever, and she starts repeating it. Now, initially, I was like, oh, so we get no more Helena characterization. Uh, whatever. Not cool. And then I went back and rewatched it, and an interesting read of the scene could be that she anticipated what uh, Alicent was going to say, uh, and that her father was dead, and it was sort of a coping mechanism to, like, not think about it, or sort of change the conversation um, of, like, her reverting to just saying, like, uh, the beast beneath the floorboards, or going back to, like, her vision stuff, because she didn't want to think about it in that moment, which would be really cute. Um, there obviously was opportunities to have other, uh, other Helena stuff in the episode, which they didn't do, um, which was a little unfortunate, because if we had gotten another scene where she was, um, acting like she did, um, last episode, I would have forgiven all of this, but, uh, we didn't get that. Um... I imagine if Alicent isn't in next episode, she isn't either. Um, the, um... Ah, oh, fuck, I was going to say something else, but I've forgotten. Um... Fuck, fuck, fuck. Oh, there is a cute... A little bit of an interaction here with her and Otto where uh, she, she's just like, he's not here to, about Aegon. And the way she said that had a little bit of characterization in it. Um... Well, technically everything has characterization in it. Um, a bit of effective characterization in it. Um, but yeah, it, it sort of cooled off uh, my uh, liking of Helena a little bit uh, in this episode, which I didn't initially appreciate, unless that second reading is true. But I'm not sure if I'm bought too much into that um, emotionally. Um, the beast line, we talked about that. Um... Yes, I've talked about all of this dot point. Um, obviously, also, they don't really make a big deal about this, but she is now the queen. Uh, obviously, through implication, this is easily understood by the audience, but uh, you'd think at the coronation they would be like the new king and queen, 
and like they would uh, raise each other's hands or something rather than Aegon just having the spotlight. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting uh, what they do with Helena moving forward. Uh, uh, we'll get more scenes of her hopefully now that she's queen. Well, I don't think she's going to be in next episode. Um, uh, yeah, I can't engage with this too much, uh, Mr. Robo Ghost. Uh, speculating on how much more or what type of Helena scenes we'll be seeing in the future. Because I got all the knowledge. But uh, nonetheless, Helena. Uh, 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 something to keep your eye on. Um. Then the next part of the episode is sort of uh, running through, trying to find Aegon. Um, it is interesting that the bulk of this episode is this stuff. Um, my biggest dot point and the biggest thing about the whole episode is sort of more of an Alicent female agency point, but I think I'll avoid that until later. Um, oh, and this is sort of interesting because it puts Alicent and Otto directly at odds. Um because obviously he sends the twins off, the twin, the Kingsguard twins off to find um, Aegon. One of them is his sworn protector, protector, so he should know where he is, but uh, there's a whole back and forth with uh, with Otto there. Otto was so, almost a little frightening in that scene where he's sort of uh, being... The, the veneer is dropped and he's being very direct with Eric there. Um, it, it was an interesting. It adds to his characterization. Um... The, um, and obviously Alicent has Eamon and Kristen go out and look, um... And we get interesting scenes of sort of them together. Now, I mentioned last time that the twins, sort of their absence has been noted, um, by book people. And he talked about how they were one of the original seeds of what the Dance of Dragons originally grew into, because they are mentioned so early in A Game of Thrones, um, in, like, the second Bran chapter, where he's reflecting on all of his favourite and all the most famous Kingsguard from history, um... I guess don't go back and read that chapter because it will have a spoiler for how the twins end up. Um, but w we needed some characterization for them because they're going to be mildly important moving forward uh, in the very imminent future. Um, and so they tried to do a lot of that this episode. Um, and clearly, uh, one of them helps Rainies get away and they have clearly split. Uh, they have split loyalties. Um, and we sort of get that through their scenes where one of them is sort of expositing about what Aegon usually does and the other one is, like, judging him and being like, this is fucking fucked up, what a shitty king, who would want him as a king? Um, and it seems like that one is going over to Rhaenyra's side. Um, what was the woman trying to, uh, trying to imply about Aegon's taste? Um, it's either that he's bi or that he's a pedophile. Um... Probably that he's bi, um, I would think. Because, I don't know, they haven't been scared to characterise Aegon as a terrible person. This is continued in this episode, obviously, by him visiting, like, a fighting pit of children. Um, and him having, like, a bastard that he might be throwing into the fighting pit or something, or that just hangs out there. Um, and, yeah, Eric or whatever says he probably has more everywhere. Um... I think, uh, and obviously we had the rape stuff last episode. Um, I don't know if we need to make Aegon a pedophile too, and having him be bi is uh, sort of harmless to the audience uh, understanding of him. And they do try to make him a, a little bit more understandable this episode in ways we will get into. Um, we're trying to avoid the Alicent Aegon stuff uh, to save it for later. Um, but yeah... I think I think I'm I'm leaning towards by. Um, obviously, we also have the when Aemond was thirteen, he sort of pressured him into going to whorehouses, um, like our favorite boy Damon did. Um, but Aemond seems to have not been into that. He he ha he sort of scorns it later on. He says he has no taste for uh, uses a word that starts with D. I forget what it is now. Um, and it is, it is, it is cute, the, uh, the Kristen stuff where he's like, all women are of the mother and are to be held with reverence or something. Um, which sort of goes against incel Kristen, though I guess it sort of plays into it where he thinks that women, um, these spotless pure creatures that should not be defiled or whatever. Um, 
I guess it's just a more traditional view than an incel view. But anyway, um, that plays into things as well. Um, into the female agency thing that we're not talking about yet. So quit bringing it up. Um, but yes, we get the twins introduced. They run around a bit. They come into... One of them has to fight Kristen, kind of. Um, Kristen wins. Uh, and then they both... Everybody's chasing Aegon around after they find him. He was, like, stored. The White Worm found him, stored him in the Sept. Um, Aemon has to tackle him everything. There is some interesting Aemon stuff where he basically tells Kristen that he should be the king. Uh, he stops himself right before he does it. Um, and everybody sort of understands this. And even when Aegon runs over to him and is like, I'll run away, I'll do the, I'll pull Elena. Uh, I think we're teasing that another character in the future is going to pull Elena. Uh, for all my book viewers out there, uh, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I think we're going to get another Elena situation. Um, it's not going to be with Aegon, though. He turns it down. Well, doesn't turn it down, but is forced to kind of turn it down and then embraces being king later in the episode. But we'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, but this is like... Because obviously the Kristen stuff they brought up just running away and the lane or stuff actually did happen and then they bring it up here with Aegon again. But yes, if Aegon was thought to have died or something and then Aemon would become king, I think it would probably be better for everybody. A Aemon would be more suited to be king. Or he could potentially is too cruel... Uh, maybe. Um, but I think Allison and Kristen and Otto would all <laughs> like it better if Aemond was the one that they were making the king. Now, obviously, this plays into Aegon's, like, depravity might have been the word, the D word I was looking for before. But sort of Otto being, um, uh, what do you call it? Disappointed in Aegon constantly in episode seven, him slapping him when he gets drunk and passes out and stuff like that, and Allison screaming at him to, like, uh, to like become more kingly or whatever um and this is all played into here where he's really not fit um but nonetheless he's being thrust into this position i thought the white worm was holding onto the bastards pre uh, slash pregnant women produced by Aegon as leverage huh that might have been the implication i definitely didn't pick up on that um well, I guess the white woman's, like, uh, spy subject is is walking around there. Um, I guess we can talk about the um, Missaria stuff. Um, it is interesting. Obviously, Otto recognizes Missaria from being from on Dragonstone. Um, now, it's interesting that he didn't know who she was. Um, but in episode four, uh, he is clearly in dealings with her a lot because when he is told that the White Worm has a message for him, he goes out personally and is told about the Damon Rhaenyra stuff that one of the, uh, the not little birds, uh, saw as they came out of the whorehouse. Um. <laughs> These fucking yawns. Can you believe that shit? Uh, where are we going with them? Sorry, stuff. So their meeting is interesting. Um, there is something that Minty pointed out that every woman sort of in the episode... I guess, except for Rainies at the end, um, has, like, a virtuous goal in mind, while all the men kind of don't. So, Missaria wanting, like, the, the child fighting rings to be shut down, which, uh, Otto seems to agree to, um, is interesting. I don't think we've gotten any indication that Missaria is, like, this good person, so that was interesting. We'll see where that leads going into the future. Um, but yes, it's interesting that they both meet. Um... The, the auto scene, um, it's interesting for other reasons. And I thought of other reasons, but then I forgot it. But Robo gets the same things in chat. The tea that the girl drank was given uh, by the head servant who works for the White Worm. Uh, did she die off screen? Oh, you're talking about the... Um, well, that couldn't be that bastard because um, the bastard is already like two in it and we haven't time skipped. It's like the next day, um, this episode. But yes, it could be other ones that she sort of spirited away or something. Um, though also Aegon is going around fucking in a bunch of whorehouses and is bound to get people pregnant, right? Robert had a bunch of bastards too, and I'm pretty sure that's the parallel that's being made here. Um, but yeah, it could be through the coordination of Tyler or Tyner or whatever her name is um, that she's collecting them. I, but even then, the White Worm, like, hates this practice, but the, the kid is right at the fighting pit, so that wouldn't... I don't know why she would store him there. Um, 
but potentially maybe. Um, also, wait, what were we talking about? We were talking about the sit-down scene uh, that's peeped by Eamon and Kristen, which might come back later. Um, and obviously Lari somehow finds out about it and then burns down Masari's, uh, like, mansion later. Um, and was she in there, or will she... Well, I guess I just alluded to the fact that Masari is going to do things later. <laughs> Uh-oh. Um... But he set another fire and he killed the last people, so I guess the implication is that he killed her too this episode. Uh-oh. Accidental spoiler. Um, I'm pretty sure that'll be revealed at the very beginning of next episode, so not too big of a spoiler, everybody. Um, is Masaru in the preview? She might be. So maybe maybe I didn't spoil anything, but I guess people don't want to hear the previews either. Um, maybe when RoboGhost said, did she die off screen? He was asking about Masaria, and maybe not the serving girl from last episode. I don't know. Maybe I fucked up. Maybe I didn't. Uh, anyway, um, I think that's most of the Masaria stuff. What are the notes do I have here besides the big one? Um, oh, in sort of a parallel... Oh, I was? Uh-oh. Um, I don't know. You can figure it out. They would have showed her death if she actually died. Anyway, um, oh, there's a, there's another Cersei Allison parallel that might be indicated on. Um, Allison is told, uh, is told by Laris that her handmaiden is a spy, which is the girl we're talking about, um, which is a very similar to a Cersei situation in the fourth book, um, where, where, uh, oh my god, what is her name? Taina Merriweather tells her that her handmaiden is spying on her for Marjorie, and she gives the handmaiden over to Kyburn, and Kyburn does, like, wicked experiments on him. Which is interesting, because Laris is obviously... The first thing you think of is Varys, because their names are the fucking same. Um, except for one letter. Uh, but it's uh, but the parallel to Kyburn might be more apt for Laris, because he's a fucking sicko. And Kyburn is a sicko, too. In the show, Kyburn is kind of not that much of a sicko, but in the book, he's raping people and stuff. Um with the brave companions and we can't be liking any of them um and he's doing creepy experiments that are like drain the blood of people while they're alive and shit like that just like this happens to the handmaid it's sort of be interesting if the handmaiden is sort of handed over to laris in some sort of sick torturous way or her tongue is cut out and then she works for him or something because we see her and a bunch of other servants be like put into the dungeons early on so like the word doesn't get out that viserys is dead um which is interesting um, I guess another thing that I didn't, another scene that I didn't write anything down about that we should address is, um, I didn't say anything about the Caswell stuff. The Lord that is trying to escape to help Rhaenyra, um, but is killed and then hung up, uh, in front of everybody, um, and all that stuff. So they get a bunch of Lords and some of them refuse to bend the knee and a bunch of them do, um... These are, there's not many lords in there. Obviously, these are just the lords that happen to be in King's Landing or are from surrounding lands. Um, though Caswell is uh, in the Reach a little bit far away, but it is like the one of the closest to King's Landing Reach houses. Um, um, but uh, yeah, so none of the major lords are, are there to swear fealty, but it seems like a bunch of the minor ones in the King's Landing surrounding area have sworn fealty to Aegon, which might make... Uh, a direct invasion of, of King's Landing or the surrounding area is difficult for Rhaenyra. Uh, I wonder if we'll have to talk about that next time. But um, they do start speaking about some of the larger houses too. Um, Otto speaks specifically about Riverrun and Highgarden as their potential allies whom potentially they have been scheming with previously. Um, we've got mention of the Tullys a little bit previously and their dealings with the Bracken and Blackwoods. So that's definitely a developing story. Um, I wonder if we'll go to Riverrun next episode. Uh, we will have to go there eventually. Um, more so than even Game of Thrones, I think we will see uh, all of the major places. Because we, because remember in Season 7, they're like, oh, here's Highgarden really quickly for an episode, and here's uh, Lannisport and Castle Rock. And Castle Lock and, and, and Lannisport looked like shit, and Highgarden was just a castle. Um, I guess I assume that Highgarden has like a city or a town around it, but that might not be true. Because not, like, Winterfell doesn't really have a town around it. I think it does, actually. But um, it is interesting, because I just assumed that all the major seats were, like, cities, like King's Landing or something. 
but um, it's not. Like, Old Town is a major city. White Harbour is a major city in the north. Um, and then there's, like, King's Landing. King's Landing and Duskendale is kind of a big city. Uh, Alanisport is a big city, but Castle Rock, which is kind of right near it, is not. Um, I don't think River Run has a city at all, because obviously it's a castle in, like, three meeting parts of a river. Um, I don't know. These are just assumptions I had in High Garden. Maybe they weren't fucking around in that show, and it just is a castle. Um... Nonetheless, uh, High Garden and River Honor mentioned as potential green allies, and then Storm's End, we got to marry a daughter, it seems. They don't say who's going to marry the daughter. This will be a focal, focal point of next episode. We are getting the Storm's End stuff. We'll be going there. Now, if you remember, previously, in this series, we have been to Storm's End. Now, Storm's End is somewhere we never went in the original series. Uh, we just pretended it didn't exist for the whole show. Um... I think it's the only one that wasn't shown, right? Because I think we are shown... We are at River Run. Um, I guess technically, whenever... We've had this conversation before, and technically I don't think we ever actually go to Sunspear, because we're just in the water gardens the whole time. Um, but yeah, the rest of them are shown in the original shot, I'm pretty sure. Doesn't matter. Um, we'll be seeing them I, uh, pretty directly in the... Uh, in the coming episode. Storm's End, very specifically, next episode. Uh, get hyped, everybody. Get hyped. Um, so we'll see. We'll see who Storm's End ends up, who the Baratheons end up supporting. Oh, but I was mentioning that previously we were at Storm's End, but we only got internal shots. There was no external Storm's End shots, and I think we're going to get it next episode. It's a big fucking dome thing, so it's going to be cool to see. And that's probably why we never saw it in the original show, because... Uh, uh, it's a complicated thing to, uh, to probably CGI fucking craft or whatever. Anyway, um, all that stuff was interesting, a fun time. Um, I think this is where we get into the big rainy Alicent Aegon crowning stuff, all this stuff. Now, um, this didn't hit me until afterwards and I went back. I feel like this episode is a big uh, feminist plea for female agency. Um, obviously Alicent is, like, the central character, and if it's not her, it's Rhaenys, and these are two queens that sort of, uh, well, Rhaenys isn't, it was the queen who never was or whatever, but two women of power trying to compromise, uh, and it failing, basically. Um, now, throughout the episode, it's sort of shown how Alicent wields power, and she sort of, uh, exposits this when she's talking to Rhaenys. Uh, I think I wrote down the exact quote she initially has. Um... We do not rule, but we may guide the men that do, gently and away from violence and sure destruction, and instead towards peace. Now, um, again, Preston's best videos are the Brienne ones, um, and they're not even really theories, they're really just big analysis pieces about gender in Game of Thrones, and sort of Brienne's place in all of that, more specifically. Um, but in that, there's a lot said about uh, w women and how women both in the real world during this time when, like, legally women had basically no rights and no powers, um, and it was impossible for them to have rights and powers, and even when they are rightfully supposedly powerful and supposedly should have rights, they are sort of robbed, as Rhaenys was at the Great Council when, the, like, the vast majority of everybody voted for Viserys, who didn't really even want to be king and wasn't really fit to be king when she was over him. He didn't even have a dragon. She did. Um... Uh, but yes, uh, and it's all fucked up, and basically, Alicent's idea here, and sort of the resignation that even Cersei and a lot of the female characters have later, um, in, in the main series, and, uh, presumably had throughout history, is that they sort of have to be influences of the people of, in power, they sort of, uh, as wives, they sort of have to, uh, they can control their husbands, as wives usually do, in ways, if they are clever enough, um... And this is sort of an implication to that. Uh, we do not rule, but we can guide them. Uh, these men are fucking idiots. They'll all try to kill each other always. And we sort of have to uh, th get no thanks, but try to save people and be guided towards peace. Now, obviously, the um, the Seven is the deity of, of Westeros, of the Andals. Uh, not all of Westeros. Not in the North. Not, in, not with the Blackwoods and not in Suns. Actually, I guess in Sunsphere it kind of is. Um, but also not on the Iron Islands, at least not to everybody. The Drowned God and whatever. Nonetheless, for all the Andals, it is. And it's a god with seven faces, and and each of the seven are supposed to be virtuous. Um, 
hold on, could I name them all? Warrior Smith, Crone, Mother, Stranger, uh, I can't remember the other two. Um, I kind of want to think about it, but it's not going to be very entertaining. There's seven faces. It's a fucking Catholicism meme. You remember how there's like three of them in Catholicism? Well, this one's got seven and George R. R. Martin used to be a fucking Catholic. And these are a bunch of white people. So we had to give them the Catholic religion. Nonetheless, um, the mother is supposed to be like the guiding principle for women. She's supposed to nurture and look after children. And, and, and this is sort of, uh, and obviously the Kristen earlier in the episode directly references the mother. Um, I'm still thinking about what the other two are and it's distracting me and I need to stop. Uh, and I've kind of forgotten the point we were going to here. Um, but also it, it, it invokes gender roles, right? This is a, a female's duty. The birthing bed is their battlefield. Um, this is all played through throughout the entire season, really. Um, the whole show is about a fucking queen trying to get her throne that she's owed, um, but being robbed by these men. But in actuality, she's kind of being undermined by another woman, and that's kind of the point here, is that maybe underneath the surface of these dumb fucking men, the women are actually the ones in power, just not in direct power. And, um, this is kind of Catelyn's role, especially towards the beginning of Game of Thrones and later. Well, it kind of shifts, right? Because initially, Cath- Cat- Ooh, Catherine... Catelyn Stark is, like, kind of manipulating Ned at the beginning of A Game of Thrones, trying to get him to send uh, John to the wall, trying to get him not to... Oh, is he trying to get him to... Ex- yes, because they swap it in book and show. She's trying to get him to accept the role of Hand of the King and basically saying, if you don't, Rob, it's going to kill all of us, or it's going to lead to ill will that'll get us all killed, and she's sort of fearful of her children and her husband and everything. The normies uploading their fucking reaction already, can you believe this? Uh, I just got the notification and it distracted me. But then Catelyn, as war starts to unfold and so, uh, kids start to fucking die and get kidnapped, uh, comes around to being sort of like this, we need to sue for peace at every opportunity um, sort of character where she's sort of over war and over vengeance. Um, thematically, I guess this comes full circle when she becomes Lady Stoneheart later and is uh, only thinking about revenge and is killing a phrase by the fucking truckload and being sort of uh, evil and trying to get Jamie killed and Brienne killed and everybody, um, and she's sort of lost her way thematically. Um, but we've seen Alicent go through a similar sort of journey, where initially maybe in episode six and seven she was trying to manipulate things, um, but now she's sort of just like, we just need kind of the peaceful solution, the most peaceful solution. She's sort of caught in a crossroads, right? Because the most peaceful solution is let Rhaenyra ha- take it, bet on their relationship and hope that she won't kill your kids or that Damon won't do it in mysterious ways where they fall off horses. Um, which is possible. But not, uh, not, uh, certain, I think, is the word I'm looking for. And also, you've sort of got to be at the whim of somebody else when you could be at the whim of yourself. And I don't know if you want to make that bet with your life and your children's lives and your grandchildren's lives. So we actually do see Alison, uh, not Alison, Helena and, um... Aegon's kids uh, in that scene earlier, obviously. Last episode, I'd made a big deal about whether or not we had or hadn't seen them. Also, Daeron is apparently going to be in the show, Alicent's fourth kid. Apparently, he is squiring in Old Town and will be in season two. Uh, they probably should have mentioned him at least at some point, um, but they haven't, and this was confirmed on Twitter, so Lamau. Uh, also, Aegon and Helena are supposed to have three kids, so we're not time skipping, so I don't think she's going to pop out another kid unless there's like a kid in a cradle someplace else being looked after by a wet nurse. Um, it brings into question an odd decision that they will have to make in the future. Uh, the fact she, she kind of imperatively has to have three kids. But nonetheless, we're getting distracted a little bit. The, um... What were we talking about before this? Oh, the Catelyn stuff, the mother's version. And obviously the big meme is Catelyn is sort of defined as the mother character. I think she is the only point of view mother character at the beginning. Danny obviously is pregnant in the first book. Uh, kid doesn't come. Uh, dead Lamau. Um, is Catelyn the only mother POV character in the entire fucking... Th- well, obviously Cersei later, which is what I was getting to. Um, but I've undercut my own point as we've gone. Besides Cersei and Catelyn, are there any other mother POV characters? Because the other girls are like Sansa, Arya, Brienne, uh, Ariana, Osha, 
Osha might be pregnant right now, but she hasn't had no babies yet. Um, yeah, I don't think there is, unless I'm forgetting somebody specific. Any uh, prologue characters? I think they're all men. Um, but yes, I think, I think I'm correct on that. But nonetheless, this seems to be where Cersei's role might go in the future, and it especially was her role in the show. They play up her love of her children a lot. Um, Cersei's probably going to lose everything pretty momentarily in the books and might end up in Dawn trying to find Marcella or something. So, um, the sort of, uh, the, the caricature of the mother here is sort of, uh, being explored. And, um, Minty told me that on the inside of the episode, they basically say Rhaenys didn't kill everybody when she had the opportunity at the end of the episode because she, like, understood Alicent's pain as a mother and what this would mean to her if they all died. Um and she flies away instead. And they sort of connect as mothers a little bit, and that's sort of what they have related. So motherhood is definitely a big part of womanhood generally, so it is a big part of any sort of discussion um, about female agency and things like that. Um, But uh, continuing on here... Hold on. I'm going to have to cut a thing out, I believe. Hold on. Doesn't matter. Where are we up to? We're talking about the Alicent Rainey's stuff. Um, I guess I'll just jump to whatever my mind thinks of. I'm not going to try and remember where we were up to. Just on the Rainey stuff. Initially, obviously, um, it's a bit silly. And now, uh, I think I've made fun of certain criticisms along this sign previously uh, about the show and about certain little things not making sense or whatever and just being like, whatever, I don't care. Rainy's just popping up underneath a bunch of innocent people and killing them all and just to make an escape with her dragon. Like, there has to be another way out of the dragon pit, right? That's how they get their dragons out. You don't just have to burst through the floor. Um, also, are all the other dragons going to fly free now? Or I guess I guess she went out through the doors. Um, but yeah, it was like, that's probably the most evil thing anybody's done in the show, but the, the way it was portrayed is like, we're not supposed to care, really. Um, about any of that. Um, and then her not killing, like, the high towers is a bit... Like, you were willing to kill all the mothers you just killed as you burst up through the ground, but not after that. And I don't think Rainey's is going to be a big antagonist moving forward. I think it's just supposed to be, like... And because I saw, like, a bunch of tweets, 70k likes, 110k likes, what a badass entrance. And also, how did she get her armor on? Like, I'm pretty sure you need help to put armor on. And she did it kind of quickly, and what was the... She was probably in a rush, and... Is her armor just stored down near the dragon stuff? And obviously the point is to come around and have her look really cool. Um, because we haven't seen, I don't think, a female dragon rider in armor, because Danny never did that. Um, which was kind of a meme, how Danny would always look picture perfect with all her makeup done while she was on top of a dragon. And also she would just hold on to a dragon, she didn't even have a saddle. There were some silly things in the original show that they've definitely done tried intentionally to correct um but yeah i was just thinking should i just go live again already but no we'll just we'll just continue recording here um but yeah some of that stuff is wacky it felt very like it felt like a very soy out let's pump our fists moment um and i've been begging for rainies to have moments like this but i don't know if this was the exact right moment um it seems to have gotten the job done with a majority of people, though, so I guess everybody will love Rainies now. Um, we were talking about female agency and sort of the motherhood aspect of female agency. Um, now, this is obviously a part of it, um, but we see many other parts, and we'll talk about the mother thing specifically in a second with the Aegon scene. Um, but obviously, through female agency, when you sort of find yourself, even in uh, contemporary society, but especially so in heightened so, in medieval society where they have no real legal rights and uh, any ways to ascend any sort of corporate or job seeking or military ladder. Um, there's obviously a sexual aspect where you can use to control men sexually. Now we see this in the foot fetish stuff with uh, Larry Strong in this episode. That was something I had heard hints about uh, before it. So when that happened, it wasn't entirely surprising to me. Uh, I'll watch the normies reaction after this and see everybody uh, freak out when it happens, I assume. Um, I saw a lot of things on Twitter about it already, too. Um, it really, as soon as she took her shoes off, it was like, oh, there's something weird about this. It was pretty well shot. Um, 
Laris being into feet stuff is interesting. Obviously, he has a club foot. Um, I assume that ties into it somehow. I don't remember uh, ever hearing anything on the wiki that uh, about Laris Strom having a foot fetish. But maybe maybe this is a mushroom meme that they actually finally included. Still no mushroom. I don't think we're getting him chat. It's sad. Um, but yeah, Cersei would also always exercise this. She was fucking Lancel. She's fucking some of the Kettle Blacks. She's, uh, she finds herself powerless because Stannis doesn't want to fuck her. She tries to seduce Ned when Ned sort of, uh, says, uh, puts all of his cards on the table. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of things there. Obviously, she's sleeping with Jamie, and there's a potentiality that she's only sleeping with Jamie not because she loves him, but because she's scared of the Valencar theory, and she can't bring herself to sleep with Tyrion to pacify him. Um, and obviously, this is like a people say this about women all the time that uh, guys are pussy whipped and, and stuff like that. So obviously, through female agency, there is the sexual aspect which is shown, and then the motherly aspect which we've kind of touched on already. But this is specifically shown in the Aegon scene in the in the chariot, which I initially didn't like. I I must not have been paying attention properly because uh, this probably is the best scene in the episode. Maybe maybe another contender is the Rainey's talk scene. Uh, which I guess we haven't specifically talked about, though we've referenced a bunch as well. But just on this one, um, Aegon is sort of still moping around. He doesn't want to be king, and it's sort of in this chariot that he decides that he will be king, and then later at the coronation, he sort of starts to feel it. Um, Aegon's characterization is a very difficult thing, because, right, we did make him a rapist last episode. Before that, he was just sort of a uh, potential womanizer, um, and that's not going to make people dislike a character. Um, and, like, he's, like, a drunkard, like, teenage horny boy jerking off out of windows. It's, it's kind of gross. It's kind of endearing. Rape is not kind of endearing. Um, and even after they did that last episode, there is sort of an endearing part of his whining afterwards. Um, so it seems like they're trying to not have him just be the most evil Ramsey archetype. He's just sort of a, a, a frat boy, fuck boy type, which we might see him come out of this, maybe, as a king, um, though I don't think we'll ever be positioned to view him as outrightly likable because I don't think the show wants to get accused of being, like, rape apologensia. Um, and I think anybody that might like him or get inklings of liking him will also not want to be accused of that as coming out as, like, a fucking egg on the second stan. Um, they don't ever say egg on the second. They just say egg on, huh? Now, he's being cor- coron- coronated, so he is egg on the second... Second, they probably say second of his name when they say ruler. Uh, they said Roynar again, by the way. Uh, Poggers. Even though those Dornished won't be liking that. Um, the... Wait, where were we up to in this? We were talking... Oh, the scene in the chariot. Um... Because he's moping around, and basically we come to understand through the scene that all, he acts like this because he doesn't think anybody really cares about him. He doesn't think his mother loves him. He doesn't think his father cares about him at all. His brother's his brother kind of resents him. He's he doesn't really connect with his sister, um, not Rhaenyra or Helena, who he's married to. Um, he doesn't seem to have any friends. Um, he was beating up Jason Luke last episode, so he doesn't seem to be uh, too on their side. So he does seem a little alone, and obviously, like when you're alone, your whoring or whatever is is sort of an archetype. Um, but yeah, so him sort of uh, the, the, this scene ending with him like with uh, Alicent trying to like start scheming and telling him what he needs to do and to go against Otto and go with her, and he sort of just interrupts the whole talk, just asking her if she loves him. Um, it's kind of cute. And then her response of, like, you imbecile, and her smiling, like, uh... It's not, like, an outright smile, but, a, like, of it's sort of, like, an of course. Um, is, um... It's cute. Uh, and it does a lot for Allison, I would say. It's a... And obviously it is a step in, in, uh, in Aegon's development here. Because also when he's looking at the dagger, he sort of is starting to understand and is like, I guess I am going to be the fucking king. And as he walks through the coronation, and then he gets to the top, and then he hears his name announced, and he starts throwing the sword up in the air, and he starts to see that the people also seem to like him, because it is a, they do frame it awkwardly, um, where it's like, are the people receptive to Aegon, or are they all going to be Rhaenyra stands? Um, 
But then again, we saw the play, and it seems like most people um, would want the boy to inherit it, not the girl. And there is actually, like, one shot. I caught one extra in the background who was a dude, like, getting really excited when they announced that Aegon was going to succeed him or whatever. And there is murmuring. Um, but it seems like the people generally would prefer him over Rhaenyra. Um, and so he seems to get some validation uh, or some self-worth from that as well. Um... But um, but yeah, it seems like we've we've gone through this journey kind of since episode f- f- six. Is episode five? He's still a little baby kid. Um, of him not wanting to be king, and he seems to want to be king now, and seems to have embraced it. Um, the uh, the mother thing that we mentioned earlier with Rainies and Allison and her not killing him because of the mother thing. I guess that does play into account, and this is ties into this because Allison does put herself in front of uh, Aegon as the dragon comes in uh, to protect him, um, which would also show him that she does care about him uh, selflessly uh, and potentially unconditionally. Um, well, this this was all preempted as this is another... And obviously, through her loving or through her shows of affection to her son, her son will probably do what she wants. So that's another way to um, have agency as a woman in this society. And then also as a daughter is also explored through Otto, where Otto can't be as ruthless in his opposition to Alicent, obviously, because he is partial to her, because... Uh, partial. Um because uh, of her being his daughter and everything. Um, and obviously she had some power of influence in Viserys' ear um, as she was the queen, um, which is now queen regent. Well, I guess she's not queen regent because Aegon is... Uh... I used to think regent just meant the, the, the king's mother or the former queen. Um, that's not what it meant. Cersei was the queen regent to Tom and Joffrey because they were both too young to inherit the throne because you got to be 16 and Joffrey's like 13 in the books or whatever. No, it's probably like 15, huh? Um, and obviously Tom and he's young as fuck. Is Joffrey like 13? Because Rob is 14, right? And so is John. And Danny is 14 too. Well, she turns 14 in like the third chapter of her, of her third chapter. Um... Joffrey's bigger than them, but he might also be younger than them, because Joffrey's like six foot seven or something in the books, because Robert is so big. Nonetheless, well, Lamau doesn't matter that Robert's so big, but Jamie is also a giant, so, um, nonetheless. All these noble houses, they be big. Except for Ned, I'm pretty sure Ned is supposed to be short, because he's the underdog and he's our hero, we gotta love him. Anyway, so there are a bunch of, uh, ways through which to, uh, exercise power here and Alicent seems to be doing it on most fronts now her, her now oh also it is maybe again hinted at my great fan fiction that Kristen and Alicent might be uh fucking because th- there is a scene where she's like for your feelings for me as and then she says like and it's like dot 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 as a queen so I was like hmm are we hinting that more stuff is going on here um they keep teasing us every time I think it's dead Every time that... Uh, well, uh, fuck, I was going to do the fucking Godfather 3 part. But I forgot the specific l- verbiage of the line. Just when I'm out, they pull me back in. I remembered. I'm thinking of Silvio. Um, the... Hold on. Where are we up to in this fucking note? Um, I already mentioned... The, oh, we were talking about the Kristen Allison stuff. Um, maybe. Maybe I'll get my dream wish. Um... But yeah, so... Oh, I was going to bring up how, like, Cersei and, and Alicent kind of do it differently, because uh, Cersei is directly fucking a bunch of people, whereas Alicent uh, seems not to be, though potentially with Kristen, but that might be more of a lustful thing than a control thing, because he's just so damn cute. Um, Alicent said so herself in episode one. Um, but, um... Because the most direct sexual thing, obviously, is the foot fetish thing. But, um... Yeah, so it's it's different. I think Cersei is stupider than Alicent, so she's just like, dumb, uh, fuck man, man dumb, man do what want. Uh, whereas Alicent sort of sees things more tactfully. Um, and I think this ends up kind of being Cersei's undoing, is her sleeping around and stuff. Well, kind of directly through the creation of her kids. Um, through Jamie, but in other regards too. Um... 
but yeah, and it's sort of like maybe a smarter girl would just use the imp- imp- use implied sexuality to her advantage and sort of lead men along rather than actually do it. Um, and that's kind of what Allison is doing. But anyway, uh, now I have notes about the conversation with Rainies. Um, and the note that all the women kind of want peace, Minty also brought this up, that it's kind of both progressive and sexist, that, like, this show's kind of saying that women would be better leaders, but the reasoning, which is congruent with, like, a lot of thematic George stuff, is that because they're naturally more peaceful, which could be seen as sort of a uh, a not-so-progressive talking point, that women are just uh, nurturers and they would always uh, not feign for peace, but... Uh, because Fane is, like, faking it for peace, but would always lean towards a peaceful outcome. Uh, Rainy seems to defy that later in the episode, obviously, though, um, where she's basically choosing and starting the war. Um, it'll also be interesting whether Rhaenyra and whether or not she will be l- lent towards peace. Now, the preview does sort of answer that, but I guess I'm not going to talk about preview stuff too much, um, especially when it comes to characterization. Um, and obviously the Mother Kristen stuff, saying all women, uh, Lamau, we love all of our queens, they're all pure creatures, um, talked about Catelyn already, potentially Cersei's future role, um, also it goes into the general talk about power, the virus quote that it's just a shadow on a wall, and the, uh, the allegory, or the metaphor, or the hypothetical of a king, a priest, and a knight all being locked in a room, and who truly has the power, um, it w- would they both listen to the priest because it's a higher authority, would they all listen to the king because he's supposed to be God's, like, chosen warrior or whatever, or is the knight actually the one, uh, that has all the power because he's th- the physically strongest, um, it's sort of, uh, again, what is power, who is in power is not as, um, it's not as direct as just like, well, the king is in power because he's the king and he's supposed to have absolute authority when he can be manipulated or guided by a queen or any of his advisors or anything like that. Power is more complicated than this. Um, uh, it, and this is just sort of an interesting... Um, <laughs> an interesting uh, uh, line of thought is... um. Who is in the moral position here? Now, obviously, morality doesn't matter. Nobody thinks about stories morally. Uh, Everybody's going to probably be on Rainier's side no matter what. Uh, Just as I probably am. Because morality is for losers. Um, And everybody's going to love Rainier's, even though she did a terrible thing this episode. Um, The the Rainier stuff at the end almost feels like late season Game of Thrones stuff, where it's just sort of like, yep, we're going to blow up the scepter, there's going to be no repercussions. Now, there is a very easy potential way for there to be repercussions with the small folk getting killed by a dragon. Um, Hint, hint to, again, everybody in the know. Um, It's pretty obvious where that could be going, that there is a potentiality that it doesn't go anywhere and we're just not supposed to think about it because nobody cares about the small folk because they're not characters. Um... Now, if you are, if you put yourself in the shoes of Rhaenyra for a second, this has all happened. Aegon has been crowned king. Um, what to do? What is the moral uh, thing to do here? Should and and also for Rhaenys, what is the moral thing to do here? Because Rhaenys denying Aegon certainly means war. If she can posture um, on the green side to divert war, is that her duty as a person to humankind? Um, Rhaenyra's claim is based off feudalism and the word of an absolute monarch, which are deeply immoral things. Um, uh, and it is birth-related, which is also probably agreed upon to be deeply immoral. You should not inherit power and uh, over people through just being born by the right people. Um, obviously, Rhaenyra sort of embodies this with her own children, who are going to inherit Driftmark, even though they are not Valarians by blood. Um... Theoretically, it should be the most competent that should be king, ideally, in some sort of meritocracy. <laughs> but, um, if you are to be Rhaenyra and take the most moral path, it probably is... A war is going to happen if you do anything. So, and a war will mean uh, thousands of thousands of innocent people that will be caught in the crossfires and die, property damage out the ass, a lot of infrastructure damage, and obviously people around you that you care about could die too. Um... 
you could die yourself. Uh, your enemies could die. Even enemies you previously cared about. Um, environmental damages, you could factor all of these things in. Dir- disrupt economies that could uh, harm other civilizations surrounding. Obviously, the, uh, the ramifications of war grow deep. Um, now, R- Rhaenyra's claim is going to be, right, she was promised something, and uh, she's come to collect. Now, this actually is a pretty compelling option, and it would be much more compelling if it wasn't um, if it wasn't built on monarchy and stuff like that. She would have a more moral claim, I would say. But probably, from Rhaenyra's perspective, if she is promised safety, which she will probably be in earnest offered that to remain on Dragonstone, she can keep her seat there. Um, raise her kids, be happy, uh, go between there and drift mark, maybe come to court if she wanted to, and things like that. Um, she would be getting fucked over in a sense personally, but it might be for the better good, so that might be the moral option. Now, spoiler alert, the uh, show is not ending next episode, and I don't think this is what's happening. I don't think anybody is under the illusion that this is what's happening. Um, but should we judge Rhaenyra for doing it? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not here to answer these philosophical moral questions. Um, but it is an interesting thing to think about. Um, if you were fucked over initially, and to get good on that fucking over, you have to do a lot more damage, do you have a right to do it? Um, probably if your life is at threat, yes. Outside of that, I don't know. Like, if it was, uh, if, if the decree came down as Otto wanted, um, of like, well, all your kids are going to be killed, you're going to be killed, um, then yeah, it probably is worth it to use everything at your disposal to avoid that, even if it means war and thousands and thousands and hundreds and thousands of dying, uh, dying potentially. But anyway, uh, Rainey's does a bad thing here by inciting this question mark is another little thing you can think about, but we kind of already talked about that, uh, encapsulating it all there. Um... And also, it'll be interesting what the show chooses to portray and how it chooses to position things. Um, The show has basically repeatedly sided itself with the Blacks. Uh, Clearly, the fan favourites are Rhaenyra and Daemon. Um, I wonder wonder in an overall poll what people's opinion of Alison would be right now, because I feel like I probably have a more favourable opinion of her than most people do. Um, Because I'm a green at heart, you know. I just love Alison. But, um... That would be interesting. Um, there's also a kind of a... It, it, the Rainies and Alicent conversation is kind of uh, a conflict of ideals of feminism, where Alicent is sort of seems to want to compromise here, have her son be king, and have her sort of control things potentially from the shadows through an influential, non-official fashion. Uh, whereas Rainies is sort of like, don't you imagine yourself on the Iron Throne? Like, we sort of have to take the throne. We have to feminism the way onto the throne and take it so that then women can sort of have this direct power and not be subservient to men. Uh, she even says that to her too. She's like, to your, to your husband, to your father, to your, uh, to your son, you're always like, uh, at, you're toiling at the service of men or something. Um, and Alice, it seems to believe that this is the only way, that there is no revolution coming especially no feminist revolution here in Westeros, and this is the best she can hope for, this is the best women can hope for, whereas Rainey seems to not want to uh, give up so easily, um, and potentially is still maybe a bit bitter, even though she tries to say all the time that she doesn't care about it anymore, that she was not queen. And they even do make the direct comparison in the episode of, like, Viserys would have been so much happier, probably, being a country lord, going to hunt and make his little dioramas and being married to Emma, and going to the Vale or something, um, or living on Dragonstone or something without the burden of being a ruler and knowing about the prophecy and all that, um, whereas Rainey sort of been, uh, more suited to be on the Iron Throne and things like that, so they do call that directly into comparison, that even if something is the better option, it's still because of this, this silly patriarchy cannot actualize, um, even if it was the better for the general realm, for the realm in general, and even if it's better for the people involved. Um, um, and also, it's an interesting thought that Rhaenys might still think that she is an option here. 
Um, before she's made a decision, there is sort of three factions. There's the Blacks, there's the Greens, and then there's Rainies. And Rainies might be like, maybe if these two idiots all kill each other, um, like, it, I can take the throne, and then it could pass through to uh, Baylor or Raina. Well, Baylor, because she's the oldest one. Um, but obviously this is complicated by the fact that uh, her granddaughters seem to love her supposed grandsons, uh, and they're in betrothed to them, so... Um, she could see an opportunity here, but ultimately, it seems, she's uh, signed with the Blacks. Um, what was my next uh, point here? Um, if she were made queen in this moment, what would Rhaenyra do? Oh, it's also an interesting thing, because they haven't coronated Aegon here. So if... If Alison had said, let's just put you on the throne now, uh, it might... That might be the most moral option, because the Greens... If, if Alicent and and, um, and Rainey's come to some sort of deal to do that, uh, then presumably Rainey's wouldn't let anything happen to Alicent and her children. And I don't know... The preview shows that Rhaenyra is also going to be hesitant to do anything next chapter, uh, next episode. I guess we are spoiling a slight bit from the preview. It seems like she is also hesitant the way Alison wants to betray her this episode because she's going to remember that they had just made up and she's like, I don't want to go and kill them, maybe, and stuff like that. Um, so it seems like there is a potentiality in Rhaenyra, at least at the beginning of next episode, come the end, almost certainly not, but uh, hint, hint. Um, it seems like potentially that could have been the best possible outcome to put Rhaenys on the throne in that moment, because it might have been a compromise that the Greens and the Blacks could have come to. Um, and then I guess Jace would still be the... Uh, would be... I guess he would be heir by way of King Consort, because um, Baylor would be the queen after him. Um, well, after Rhaenys. Um, it's interesting, there could have been compromises made to for Rhaenys to name Rhaenyra her heir, or... Egg on her air, but even then it probably wouldn't have been good. Um, should have put Rhaenys on the throne in this moment. Because in the book, I don't think it's mentioned at all that Rhaenys is in King's Landing while this happens. Um, and it was very weird to me last episode when the preview came out and Rhaenys was in King's Landing as all this was happening and there was an Alicent and Rhaenys conversation post-Viserys dying. Um, so this isn't really an option in the books because she's probably on Driftmark when all this is happening and not right there and not making a case. But in the show, this opportunity does sort of uh, fly away when it potentially could have been capitalised on. Um, um, is that all of my doc point? If she was made in this moment, what would Rhaenyra do? Which I sort of played into with the, um, the, the super big preview spoiler. Uh, that she might have been okay with it. Um... Also, I just realized the irony of Rhaenys' name is obviously that she, Rhaenys, is named after Rhaenys, the sister wife of Aegon, who is sort of discredited by history as sort of Aegon is the one heralded as the big conquering hero when it was really Aegon and his three sisters, and she's sort of passed over by history as Rhaenys is passed over, um, monarchically, as not being the monarch in terms of succession. It's probably what the, the 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 end of the sentence I was looking for, um, but yes, uh, they do also mention. <laughs> Which will be drink and yawn a little bit too much silence I think there. Um, they don't give Aegon Viserys' throne. Uh, crown. They give him the Conqueror's crown, um, which is laying around somewhere, which is also the crown that Maegor the Cruel used to wear. So it's kind of a taboo, bad bad mojo, because Viserys' crown is the one that Jaehaerys wore before him. And we've only had four fucking kings at this point. Well, five, because Aenys too, but Aenys wore... No, Aenys wore a different one, right? He wore... Maybe he wore the one that Jaehaerys ended up wearing? Jaehaerys, not Jaehaerys. Jaehaerys is fucking Rhaenyra's kid. Nonetheless, the crown thing will probably be important next episode. They'll probably talk about that because that is a big thing in Fire and Blood. Not a big thing, but it is something that's mentioned that I remember. Um, that's kind of it, I think. 
Um, I did just get the first battery warning, so we do have to go home uh, here soon. Uh, send it home. Um, just scrolling through my binge wheel to see if there's any uh, binge timeline, rather, to see if there's anything that we would like to point out. The Eamon stuff was cool. He should have been King Lamau. Would have been better, maybe, or he would have been crueler. All the lords bending the knee. Some of them don't want to. Some of them do. The, uh, the ones that don't want to are led to the dungeons. The one that tried to escape, though, is hung immediately. Um, we got fighting pits, Larry stuff. Rainy's talk. Uh, I wonder what the reaction is going to be now to Misari's accent. Because uh, people did not like it the first time. And apparently it is a fake accent, so you're allowed to dislike it. Um, because if it was the actual girl's accent, that would be mean. Um, it does feel very stilted, though. Um, not the best on the ears. Um, but neither is the New Zealand accent. But I'm not making fun of them. Actually, I do all the time. Maybe that's my justification for making fun of accents. Um, I feel like that's it. The coronation was cool. There were lots and lots and lots of people there. Um, and Rainy's kind of just jumped out at all of them. Wait, it ends on a somber note. How directly does it end? I forget. It just cuts from... Uh, hold on, am I picking up audio in OBS? I might be, so I should mute this. Hopefully I don't get copyright claimed for that tiny bit. Um, Aegon is looking right at Alicent as it fades out, which is cute. Like, because she, uh jumped in front of him. He knows now that she cares. A beautiful thing. Um, why can't I click off of anything? Why is it making things full screen? Binge, fuck you, get me out. Close the fucking window. Anyway, that's it. We can't do, usually at the end, we do a quick little bit of predictions with Elite RE. I don't remember what his predictions were last time. How much do we get to laugh at him? Maybe I'll rewatch them. Um, when... Uh, before we do our next recording session with Ari. I don't expect him to be back next week. He's injured. Um, there may be. Maybe he'll pull through. It'll be a miracle. But, uh, we missed our baby boy. Um, with that being said, uh, we'll be back next week with the finale. Hopefully I'll have other scripted House of the Dragon videos coming out soon. Um, we got the coupling one, we got the dialogue one, a bunch of shit on the back burner. Uh, also, Movie Night with Mr. Entertainment, that's me, uh, is up on the channel. The first one, uh, Blonde, is up. The, the second one, Casablanca, will be coming out soon. Go over there and watch that. Uh, we're doing a movie once a week. Uh, so you can you should watch along. Uh, and uh, watch along the movies, and then watch along with the fucking the reviews. Uh, they're fun. Uh, everybody should get on top. It'll be more fun with more people. Uh, but with all that being said, be back here next week. Look forward to more House of the Dragon content in the future. Mm. Support links in the description below. Thanks.